and away we go. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Moriarty. Glad you could join us today. We're going to have a little chat about uh, Madagascar. Um, I spent uh, a, almost a month there back in December and was really, really blown away by um, how amazing it was. It's, it's like nowhere else I've ever been in Africa. It's truly a, a continent apart. Um, and so I just want to kind of start to, to set the mood a little bit. We're going to start with a, uh, a video. Um, and if you stand by for just a second, we'll get right into that. So that's just kind of a little introduction to Madagascar. Um, so I work for Wildland Adventures. I'm the Africa Program Director. Uh, this is just a little bit of information about uh, Wildland and some of the good things that our friends had to say about us. Um, the A little bit about me. Uh, like I said, I just spent uh, close to a month in Madagascar. Um, prior to that, I had lived in Namibia for two years as a Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, and at this point, I've been on dozens of safaris through dozens of national parks, worked with a whole bunch of different guides and uh, certainly seen a lot of accommodation and traveled a lot of the continent. And, and really, Madagascar is truly a continent apart. It is like nothing else uh, and nowhere else I've been in Africa. Um, and because of that, it's really different. And so we figured we'd uh, take, take a little bit of time to kind of go over um, what makes it so different. So today I'm going to just talk a little bit about, um, you know, where is Madagascar? How is it set up? A little bit of its history, um, some general characteristics about it, about each of the regions, uh, the, and give you some examples of the different wildlife uh, sites and culture that you can experience in each of those places. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with a little bit of um, the seasonality of when the best time is to go. And then any some special considerations because it uh, because it isn't like a lot of other destinations. There are some some things that you want to keep in mind. So as the fourth largest island in the world, it's pretty easy for most folks to find it. But if you don't know exactly where it is, it is located off the southeast coast of Africa, right over here. Um, it is about a thousand miles or so, tip to tail. Um, so from the far north all the way down to the south is about a thousand miles. It has uh, coastal mangroves and rainforest all along its eastern border here. Uh, its predominant weather pattern comes from the east and so it kind of catches most of that rainfall here. As you head inland, you start to head into the, uh, the highlands uh, and as you head out even into the far west, uh, things really dry up. On the coast of the west, you, you start to catch a little bit more deciduous forest. Um, there are some super arid areas, particularly down here in the south, uh, where there's, you know, some years where they don't get any rain um, just because of that, that weather pattern. Um, Madagascar is a naturalist's paradise. It was initially part of Gondwana land, the supercontinent. Um, and when it split off from Gondwana land, 
um, you know, a lot of the pioneer species, uh, the ancestors of the species that are there today were, were isolated and remained isolated for a long time. And so you really have uh, an island full of endemic species. So it really is a naturalist's paradise. Um, humans arrived on the scene relatively late. Um, the first human settlements were around 500 to 200 BC. Um, and they initially came from the uh, Indonesian area rather than Africa. Um, and that's mostly just due to the predominant wind currents. So you have a pretty strong Indonesian and Malaysian influence. Uh, Arabs arrived around the seventh century uh, and, and Bantu speaking peoples from Africa only arrived on the scene at about the ninth century. Europeans arrived around 1500 or so. So all in all, humans have not really been on the scene all that long and, and the wildlife and uh, this different species of Madagascar have had a long time to, to evolve. So we're gonna talk about kind of three main areas. We're gonna start in the North today um, and talk about the uh, Antisirana, Diego Suarez, Joffreyville zone. Uh, the major national parks up there are gonna be Amber Mountain and Ankarana. Um, Nosy Bay is also, um, bit of a tropical island just offshore, um, some really nice beaches out there. Then we'll continue down to central Madagascar with the capital city of Antananarivo, uh, and then heading east from there out to Andasi Bay and Montedilla National Parks. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Lemur Island, which is certainly a, should be a highlight of anybody's trip, uh, as well as the Perine Reserve. And we'll finish up down in the south um, near Fort Dauphin, which is the major city down there. Uh, the two major ecosystems are the spiny and deciduous forest, uh, as well as the St. Luce Coastal Reserve. It's a really just kind of a wonderful place with a couple of different ecosystems, which means exceptional diversity of wildlife as well. So these guys are what everybody wants to go to Madagascar to see. Uh, obviously, this is a lemur. There are different types of lemurs. You'll hear, hear me refer to lemurs or sifakas. Um, there are close to a hundred different species of lemur, um, and they all came from one common ancestor. So everything from the little tiny guys to the really big ones all came from the same uh, ancestor. To see these, you're going to have to work for it. Um, there aren't really any vehicle safaris, so everything here is on foot. Um, and that means hiking, it means uh, some uneven paths, it means going up and down. Um, sometimes it's hot, there's bugs, there's humidity, sometimes there's ants. Um, so just be aware of that. This is not a sit in a Land Rover kind of safari. This is really an active walking safari to, to get to see these, um, to see these guys for sure. Um, lemurs can be a little bit elusive. They do live up in the trees and are, are particularly arboreal. Um, so you have to be a little bit patient to let them kind of come down um, or, you know, have a couple of sightings before you get a good one to get up close to them. Um, but every now and then you get rewarded and they're right in front of you. Um, and sometimes you're looking for lemurs and you have a wonderful sighting like the ring-tailed mongoose up there, um, which can also be pretty exceptional as well. Um, so the, the biggest trick with Madagascar is you have to be patient and you have to be ready to be impressed by the little things. Um, so most lemurs aren't any larger than a small monkey. Um, and because of that, uh, you know, you're not, you're not going to be looking for elephants or giraffes or really huge megafauna. Lemurs are a little bit smaller. Even smaller still are chameleons. Uh, Madagascar is home to about half of the world's species of chameleons. Um, most of them live in trees like uh, Ustalet's chameleon that you see here. Uh, and they're typically active during the day. Uh, they're easy to catch and feed grasshoppers. <laughs> so you can definitely see them uh, catch grasshoppers, which is pretty cool. And they're just really neat critters to, to observe in the wild for sure. Um, you don't really have to go too far to find them, even though they, they can camouflage pretty well. Um, so this is all, these, this first set of photos are all taken from the north. So this is up in northern Madagascar. Um, and luckily, all these uh, guys are pretty close to the side of the road, or even at your accommodation, you can find them pretty easily in the gardens. Um, and even though they're masters of disguise, a good guide can pick these out, even if you're just driving by. 
Um, however, not everything is so easily seen in the north. Um, one of the highlights of Madagascar is you get to find some really impressive camouflage. Uh, so there are three critters in these three photos. Um, and I'll help give you a little help here. Uh, so the critter on the right is a mossy tailed, I'm um, sorry, a mossy leaf tailed gecko. Um, and you can tell that he just blends right in with the trunk of that, uh, that little tree. He's nocturnal, so you can't really see him too well during the day. Um, and then the frogs are really impressive. There's over 300 different species of frog um, described in Madagascar, but DNA barcoding has revealed that there are actually over 500 different species. And this means that there are still 200 species to be discovered in Madagascar. Um, 10% of the world's frogs are endemic to Madagascar. Now, Madagascar only accounts for less than 1%. I think it's about 0.4% of the world's land mass. So that's pretty impressive, um, the level of an endemic species here. In the north, you also get to see some really fascinating things. Um, you know, looking at this, it just looks like some, some moss or some kind of fungus. But when you get up close, you realize that this is actually a group of flatted leaf insects. Um, and these are in their nymph phase. So really fascinating. They have this kind of waxy structure on their back um, to, to deter predators. And it just makes them look like, looks like moss rather than something they wanna eat. And then they go through this pretty radical transformation. And as adults, they look completely different, right? They wind up looking um, like these red guys. And these were actually down south. So the, the fetid leaf insect can be found um, throughout the entire island. And again, Madagascar, if, if you're easily impressed by both, you know, medium sized things and really small things, Madagascar will blow you away because almost everything you see is something that doesn't occur anywhere else on earth. Um, this next little guy is, was probably my favorite critter of the whole trip. Uh, this is a Brookhesia uh, tuberculata, uh, which is a leaf chameleon. It's one of the smallest terrestrial vertebrates on earth. And it's only found in one place um, in, in, uh, in Madagascar. It's an amber mountain um, and just an amazing, amazing little critter. Um, of course, not everything is super cute or fuzzy or cuddly. <laughs> there are some, uh, some predators there as well. So you have the Nile croc. Uh, there's also a fossa, uh, which is a uh, relative of the mongoose that hunts lemurs. Um, they're pretty elusive and pretty hard to see. And so I didn't get to see any on my trip, but they do exist there. And there's also some creepy crawly things that exist as well, but are super interesting. Um, from terrestrial land crabs to cicadas, there's tarantulas in some of the caves. Uh, on the top right there, you see a skink, um, which is kind of a cross between a lizard and, uh, and a snake. And of course, um, there's, there's a plethora of snakes. Um, there are no poisonous snakes on Madagascar. However, there are some constrictors like boas. Um, if you are not a fan of snakes or spiders, just let your guide know and they will see them, but they will make sure that they do not point them out to you. There's also some amazing landforms up in the north. These are the Red Singhi, which are eroded sandstone formations. Um, you also have the Gray Singhi, which are eroded limestone formations. Um, and this is all up and around Ankarana. Um, the limestone in particular forms some pretty amazing caves that you can explore. Um, and of course, that's a good chance to see bats as well as um, some of the spiders that we had pointed out. So if you're not so into bats or spiders, that's fine too. You can just go near the caves and check those out, but, but pretty fascinating and, and really good for active travelers if you're looking to, to explore a little deeper. Some other highlights of the North are um, getting a chance to see some of the major uh, production plantations that exist up there that help support the economy. In particular, uh, those are vanilla beans. That's one of the major exports of Madagascar, as well as cocoa. Um, so you can see the women there uh, slicing open and separating out the cocoa pods. And then below, after they've been um, dried and fermented, um, then they get processed uh, into, into actual cocoa. So super fascinating. Um, 
There's also some really wonderful markets up north, really colorful, uh, always plenty of things to look at uh, and makes for some great, great photos as well. Um, and yeah, it's just a, uh, it's, it's pretty adventurous place. And, and the north is definitely, it definitely has interesting wildlife as well as some really um, interesting cultural experiences that you can have. Um, travelers to Madagascar need to know that it is a relatively undeveloped country, meaning that um, the country in general is relatively poor and undeveloped. Only about 13% of the population has access to electricity and less than 50% of the people living there have access to clean drinking water. Um, deforestation is an issue as locals try to eke out some semblance of a living. Um, and that translates into habitat loss for a lot of the animals and wildlife that we're talking about. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a real conservation challenge here, trying to find the right balance between um, helping people sustain their livelihoods as well as preserving and conserving wildlife. Um, Market day is always a huge event um, because these people are trying to, you know, thrive in their economy. Um, so you get to see, you know, folks bringing everything they can to market. That's a pretty loaded down truck right there with some bananas and even a jackfruit and probably 30 people in the back of it. Uh, it looks like it could probably use a new suspension. And we even crossed paths with this guy bringing his, uh, you know, his share of chickens to market. Um, so again, it's it's super interesting, not just the wildlife, but but getting to engage with the locals and, and learn about um, their way of life as well. As we then head out of the north and then head down into central Madagascar, uh, I'll talk a little bit about Montadia and the Paranay Reserve. Um, again, there's always abundant frogs around and they're all pretty interesting. This guy on the right is a lowland streaked tenrec, which are really fascinating creatures and a wonderful, wonderful example of what they call convergent evolution. Convergent evolution is when you have a species uh, that has adapted to an environment and has gained certain adaptive characteristics to make it look like another species that it is in fact not related to. So in this case, this tenrec, it looks just like a hedgehog, right? I mean, it's adapted the quills. It's got the long kind of pointy snout. It's not related to a hedgehog, except way, way, way in the distant past. Um, so even though it looks like a hedgehog and it has the same adaptations, it's actually not related to that. And there's a couple of different cases of this on Madagascar, which is really interesting and a result of the island being isolated for so long. Of course, out in Montadia and uh, and Dasi Bay and the Perine Reserve, you can get some really, really wonderful uh, lemur sightings. Um, in particular, when you go out to uh, Lemur Island, um, which is a reserve for rescued lemurs that were at one point kept as pets or otherwise rescued. Maybe they were orphaned. Um, and this is an opportunity to actually get up close. And the lemurs are not shy. Um, they will actually get, get pretty close to you. Um, the, they're not wild, so it's worth knowing that, but they're also not, you know, caged or anything like that. They're kind of able, able to, you know, travel around the island within their habitat. Um, and you could, like I said, you can get really up close to them. Um, and, you know, this guy was pretty curious about, um, what was, what was being, what picture was being taken here. And so he decided to hop over and, and take a look for himself. Um, lemurs are fascinating, but the bird life is also really, really wonderful. Um, and there's also just, again, these unique species that you will find nowhere else in the world, like the giraffe necked weevil. Um, this guy is, is pretty tiny. I mean, it's a little bit bigger than a ladybug or so. Um, but just like a giraffe, the males will fight with their necks. And so they'll kind of slam their necks into each other, which is just really neat. Um, from those eastern parks of Montadia and Dasi Bay and the Perine Reserve, um, you will typically head back to Antananarivo, um, which is a major city. Um, some great accommodation there, but also some interesting historical and cultural uh, sites to see. This is King Andrianum Poinamarina's palace. Try saying that five times fast. Um, 
There's some pretty long king's names and queen's names as well. Uh, very well-preserved palace, and there's also uh, the royal tombs. So when the royal leaders died, they would bury them in these elaborate wooden tombs um, that are still present uh, within the palace today. Um, Antananarivo serves as a hub for any itinerary that we would do in Madagascar, um, mostly because uh, it's centrally located and that's where the major airport is. So typically you'll pass through there a couple of times over the course of your itinerary. And then as we head south, the major town down there is Fort Dauphin, and then you head up to the northwest into the Anosi region. Uh, there are some pretty massive sisal plantations that they use for um, kind of a natural fiber. Um, but the plantations are huge. And again, because of the deforestation from the plantations, there's limited wildlife habitat. But what habitat remains is chock full with, with pretty amazing wildlife. In particular, this is a wonderful place to see ringtails, uh, as you see here, uh, as well as Varro's Sifaka. There's two major um, kind of uh, ecosystems down there. One is the gallery or deciduous forest, which is where the safaka and the ringtails typically hang out. So it's a good place to go see them. And then from there, uh, you can head over into, oh, sorry. There's also chameleons down there. I forgot about the wordy chameleon here. So obviously a super colorful chameleon um, and again, usually active during the day uh, and you get a chance to, to get some good shots of them. And then the other major ecosystem are is the spiny forest, uh, which is where the octopus trees grow. Again, this is an endemic species of tree. Uh, there's a reason that they call it the spiny forest, even though it looks pretty green. Uh, there's still quite a bit of um, thorns on there. But wildlife has adapted to be able to, to thrive in this environment. So this safaka is able to leap from one octopus tree to another without seemingly hurting itself or pricking its fingers. And nobody really knows why or how it's able to do that. Um, so this is a great place to, to see these safakas. The bird life down there is also excellent. So here we have a, a pair of kestrels that we were pretty lucky to see. Um, and they're hunting, you know, some smaller critters that live, live down there as well. In addition to the wildlife, the flora is amazing. Um, the baobab trees uh, have, are, are just an amazing species to be around. I mean, it, it looks like an upside down tree. Um, six of the world's nine baobab species are endemic to Madagascar. I believe the other three are found in Australia. Um, and these baobabs are, are really amazing. Their local name is Reniala, which means mother of the forest. And I just really like that because they really feel like these massive, massive plants when you're there. As you wrap up your itinerary, typically you'll finish up, or what I would have you do is finish up out at the beach, um, specifically the eastern beaches of St. Luce. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play through here what, it, what it's like to arrive at uh, Manafiafi Beach and Rainforest Lodge. Um, this is a wonderful place to finish. It's, it's just a, a, a beautiful lodge. Um, you have end suite rooms, um, so you have a private deck, you, know, you have your own bathroom, indoor and outdoor shower. There's tons of wonderful activities that you can do here. Um, you can go snorkeling, swimming in the Indian Ocean, sea at kayaking. Uh, it's easy to go out for a mangrove tour. You also have the option to go uh, deep sea fishing or whale watching. Typically this is conditions dependent just because it is the open ocean. Um, and one of the big highlights here are the morning and evening walks that you can do uh, in, the, in the kind of preserved forest that's, that's just inland from the beach here. Um, and this is a wonderful place to just relax, right? If you've had a long itinerary and you've traveled and seen a lot of Madagascar, at this point you've done a bunch of hiking. Um, this is not a bad place to just enjoy some local seafood dinners, uh, you know, some locally caught seafood. And, you know, what a wonderful place to kind of uh, just curl up with a book on your own little private stretch of beach here 
um, this is a, you can see here, this is just kind of a private cove just inland from, from the open ocean, um, but just a really idyllic um, spot to wrap up. And again, on those morning and evening walks that you can go out on, uh, you'll get to see things that live nowhere else. Again, this is another Brooksia. Uh, this is a brown leaf chameleon, not quite as small as the other one, uh, but still pretty darn tiny. And this is what separates great guides from just good guides, is these guys are able to see these things at a distance and pick them out and they're just incredibly well camouflaged. It's really impressive. Um, night walks typically start just before sunsets. So you're able to catch some of the species that are diurnal, that are just kind of going to sleep for the day, as well as the nocturnal species just kind of waking up. Um, one of my favorite nocturnal species are the gray mouse lemurs um, that kind of squeak and scurry through the trees. This guy is not very big, probably the size of a softball or so. Um, and again, getting out at night, you get to see a completely different um, side of Madagascar. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to see how the, the diurnal species do not compete with the nocturnal species so that everybody kind of has their little slice of the ecosystem. Um, the mouse lemur is the smallest living primate in the world. Um, those of you who have been to Africa before might think it looks a little bit like a gulago or a bush baby but they aren't actually directly related. Again, remember all of these lemurs came from the same singular ancestor. Um, currently there are about 18 different species of mouse lemur, but most naturalists think that there's probably a few more species still to be discovered. Um, so that kind of rounds out your trip through Madagascar. You get to finish up by seeing some, some last lemurs uh, and enjoy some beach time. Um, and uh, yeah, finish off your journal and uh, think about all the pictures that you've taken over the time that you were here. So let's talk a little bit about um, seasonality and some special considerations that you need to have. So the optimal season to be traveling is gonna be from June to November. Uh, that's when it's going to be drier with really reasonable temperatures. It does start to heat up uh, as you get deeper and deeper into November. I was there in December, which is why uh, I would not recommend traveling in December. It got really hot. Um, we didn't really have any rain while we were there, but the, the rains really do start to kick up by, by January and February. Um, and then you're into cyclone season. Um, some of you may have heard about the recent cyclone that, that affected Mozambique, uh, and that is the same type of cyclone that can cross into Madagascar at that time of year as well. So um, December through February, even March, April, May, I would, I would advise kind of avoiding that if you can. Best time to be there is going to be June through November. Some special considerations, and this is something, these are a couple of items that set Madagascar apart from mainland Africa. Let's start with the north. The north is a lot rougher than the central and the south. And what I mean by that is that the drives are longer, the hiking is tougher, so much more uneven ground, much more vertical relief. Um, the guiding is good, but I would not put it into the great category. Um, it's a little less polished. Um, same thing with accommodations and food. It's just a little bit rougher around the edges. Um, there are fewer species in each park that you would visit compared to other regions in the country. So because of that, my recommendation is to look at the central and the south and kind of focus in on that. Um, you're going to have better guiding and accommodation. You're going to get a better cross-section of experiences. It's easier to link these areas as well. Um, the, let's talk about flights and roads. Flights were one of the major reasons why we were not able to offer Madagascar for a long time. It's just because they were really unpredictable and they would get canceled frequently. That has since improved, but it is still not perfect. Because of that, we build a little bit of slack into any itinerary that we're going to do in Madagascar just to allow for the possibility of delays or cancellation of internal flights within Madagascar. Um, so just kind of be aware of that. And I can talk further with you as you, as you look at your itinerary. 
Roads are also really, really rough. Um, they're so bad that some of the pop music stars in Madagascar have made music videos about how terrible the roads are. Um, so driving is a slow affair. I remember vividly when we were there, there were a couple of potholes that we literally had to drive down into across the bottom and then up out the other side. So um, roads, roads can be pretty bad and pretty rough if you're at all remotely prone to seasickness, you're going to want to bring your Dramamine. Um, that said, you can still do it. I mean, the driving is not, you know, it's still a road. So how bad could it possibly be, right? Um, and there are some charter flight options to avoid some of those drives. And I can talk more about that to folks offline. The good thing is you don't have to worry about any of those special considerations because I've already taken all of them into account and created an itinerary that I feel captures the best of Madagascar. Um, so it starts in Antananarivo, you head out to the east, re return back to Tana, and then finish up down in the south. Um, with these 12 days, you get an amazing cross-section of the country, and I think that you'll come away feeling like you've seen Madagascar and not just seen it, but experienced it, which is the most important thing. So um, yeah, so I'm really super excited that we're finally launching Madagascar. Uh, it's a wonderful destination. And uh, as I wrap up here, I wanna leave you with just kind of one thought that I think summarizes, um, summarizes Madagascar really well. So I think Attenborough, <laughs> has said it well when he said that there are some 4 million different kinds of animals and plants in the world, which means 4 million different solutions to the problem of staying alive. 80% of the plants and animals that you encounter in Madagascar are found nowhere else on earth. Um, it's, a, it's a place to see convergent evolution, uh, which I talked about earlier, solving the problem of how to stay alive. It's, you know, two species unrelated coming to the same solution of how to stay alive. And it's just incredible. Um, you know, when I traveled to this far corner of the earth and found this special place, I, you know, and realized how threatened and tenuous all these creatures are holding on, um, it was a real moving experience for me. Uh, you know, the value of these unique creatures simply can't be overstated. Um, but they need to be visited and their value needs to be demonstrated in order for them to continue to be protected. Um, I really hope that you'll consider visiting this really special place. Uh, I'd love to help you plan your adventure. So please do not hesitate uh, getting in contact with me. I'd love to answer any questions that you might have. Um, give me just a second here. Let me pull out some, uh, some questions that are here. Yeah, and if you do have a question um, on your screen, there should be a little uh, question box here that you can click on and send me your question. If I don't get to all of these, um, I'm more than happy to, um, to answer them offline. So let's see. Um, can you address the difficulties of traveling by road and how much of the country can you realistically cover in a two to three week trip? That is a wonderful question. Um, the way our trip gets broken up you cannot cover the entire country by driving without taking months and months to be able to do this. So um, the way I've got it broken up for a 12 day trip is you would drive out to the east, you would spend some time out there, drive back to Tana. From there, you would fly to the south and then um, it's mostly driving once you're down there. You would drive out to one camp, you would drive out to the other camp and then fly back to Tana. And it worked really, really well for 12 days. The reality is there's never enough time to see everything that you want to see. I mean, 12 days, how could you do, you know, Maine to Florida, right? It's, you have to pick and choose of what is going to present the best side of the country and give you the best cross section of everything. And I really feel like I've done that. You're certainly, it's certainly possible to add more days if you want. Um, and that's not difficult to do. Um, so if you wanted to do more, we can do that. Just let me know and we'll find something that works for you. Um, how early should you start planning a trip to Madagascar? Great question. So there is still space available for 2019. Um, 
but I wouldn't wait too long to start looking at that. And I would definitely say at this point, you're looking at the, you know, September, October, November is going to be prime to, to still try to find space. Beyond that, 2020 wide open. Um, so you really do want to be preparing roughly a year in advance, um, especially for really specific dates. Um, what type of lemur do you see the most? Oh man, that's a tough one. So with 90 different species of lemur, you know, I probably saw two dozen different types of species while I was there. It's really tough to say what you, what I saw the most of, but you'll see, you'll definitely see plenty of lemurs. Um, I think the one we saw the most of was the common brown lemur, um, but it doesn't matter. They're all ridiculously cute and super fun to be around because they're very active and they always seem to be doing something. Um, so would family travel be appropriate for Madagascar with younger kids? That is a good question. So I would say it depends and it depends on your kids. Um, this is not a family specific itinerary. However, I think that, you know, tweens and teens could do really well, particularly if they have a keen interest and curiosity uh, in wildlife. If they can get it again, if they can get excited about little things, I think that they'll have a wonderful time. If they're experienced travelers, I think that they would do just fine. If this is going to be their first big trip, probably not a great fit for that family. Um, same thing for really, really young kids. Because there is some car time and there is a lot of walking in order to be able to see these animals, it may not be a really good fit for little kids. So I would, I would say starting at about age 12, you know, 12 to 13, 14, if they're super keen, Older than that, they'd probably do fine as long as this is something that you think that they could be really interested in. And again, I can kind of talk through the more specifics of that with individuals. Um, and then I think I'm going to wrap it up with this last question. Um, can you use dollars and how much money do you need for food and tips per day? So great question. Um, the simple answer is our itineraries are crafted around, um, it's, it's, it's nearly fully inclusive, right? So all your meals are going to be taken care of while you're there, with the exception of a couple of meals, perhaps in um, Antananarivo. Um, but you won't need to be purchasing food while you're there. Uh, in terms of tips, we will provide a comprehensive tipping guideline to guests. Um, and that's something that if we're, if we're seriously looking at an itinerary, I'm happy to share that with you. Um, but it's, it's on par with other destinations in Africa. So you're tipping your guide, let's say roughly $15, $15 per day per person um, for the guide. And then other assorted smaller tips for um you know, the, the staff, uh, your driver, those other things. We'll provide a comprehensive um, breakdown of that, but it usually comes out to be, you know, not, not more than 25, you know, $30 is probably on the high end per person per day budgeted for tips. Um, and again, those aren't uh, expected, but they're always appreciated, particularly for good service. So I'm going to end it there. Uh, we have recorded this today, and I will send that link out to everybody. I'll also send a link to that video I played at the beginning, just to make sure that you get a chance to see it. Um, and if you do have any questions, please do not hesitate in reaching out to me uh, at the email address or just give me a call. Uh, thank you for me today. I really appreciate that you decided to share some time with me, and hopefully we can get you to Madagascar in the near future.